All right, let's go through the practice problems for processor control and the data path. So the first problem here is about adding unconditional jumps to the data path. So here's the data path we had, and the question is, how do we change the data path below to enable unconditional jumps? To do this, we're going to need to do some changes. We need to add some wires, some logic, some mucks, and controls. So let's take a look at the solution. So here's the solution for this. It's just the picture from the book. You can see here that we've got a shifter in here and some extra wires and some extra logic going on. So let's walk through what they are. So we added a wire here from the instruction bits to the shifter. And so this is the wire that takes the instruction bits from the jump instruction. Remember, there are a bunch of the bits in the instruction used for this constant. And it's going to pass it around this data path back into the next PC. We need to add some logic. This is a left shift because, remember, we shifted over by two bits. We need to add a mux. So here's the mux over here. And this mux here is now going to select between the different jump possibilities. So what possibilities do we have? Well, we have the add for one. So this is the standard one where we go on no, with no jump. We have the branch equal, the conditional jump, which goes through the adder, adds in the constant down here. And then we have our unconditional jump, which goes in through here. We need some control logic. And the control logic has to tell us which one of these branches do we take, which instruction do we use next. So the jump here is going to choose, did we do a jump or did we do a conditional or just a next instruction. All right, next question. Now, conditional jumps in the data path. So explain the logic that controls the ALU result for the MUX and for the next PC. So here's our data path that we have. We've got the ALU. We know the ALU is doing some work to figure out whether we should do a branch equal, uh, sorry, branch equal or not equal. And we've got some logic over here which determines the result from the ALU and some signals from the control and controls this MUX. So what are we going to do in the ALU, in the MUX logic, and the control logic? So let's take a look at the solution here. So what does the ALU do? Well, for branch equal or branch not equal, the ALU is going to do a subtraction. It's then going to take the result, its zero output, and send that up to the MUX logic, which is then going to use the result here to know if it should do a branch or not. What's the MUX logic going to do? Well, it's going to say if the result here is not zero and it's a branch not equal, that means they're not equal and I'm supposed to branch if it's not equal, then I take the branch. Or if the result is zero, and it's a branch equal, that means the result was zero, so they are equal, and it's a branch equal, then I do the branch. What does the control logic over here do? Well, the control logic needs to tell the MUX logic, is it a branch equal or a branch not equal? So we just need to tell it which one of those types of branches is. That combined with a zero allows us to choose the correct next instruction. So for the control here, we need outputs for both branch not equal and branch equal because we do different things depending on zero if it's equal or not equal in the branch. All right, so third question here, adding jump and link or jump register the data path. So how do we change the data path here so that we can add JL and JR? So we need to add some wires and some muxes. Let's take a look at the solution here. So we need to add a wire here. So for JL, Remember, we're going to jump, and then we're going to store the next PC value into the register file. So we need to add a wire which takes the next red PC value and can write it into the register file. We're going to need a mux here so that we can choose this input, as before we were taking the input that writes back from the result here. We may also need to write in from the next PC here. And then we're going to need some control logic in here, which controls that. And finally, we're going to need some way to tell it to write to the correct register, to write to JA, which is... Uh, register 31. As we do a return, sorry, return from register RA, which is register 31. So we need the ability to set in 31 in here and go to that register. Now what this allows us to do is take the results we had from the next PC, write it into the register file into register 31. Now how about JR? Well for JR we need to do the opposite. We need to take data out of the register file and get it into the next PC. So we're going to need a wire coming out of read data 1 it goes into the path back here for the next PC so that we can load the value from the register file and have it be the next PC. We're going to need another mux in here in order to be able to select that value or the value we had before. And finally, we're going to need some control logic which tells us which one to select. Sorry, here's the control logic tell us which one to select. So this question is about instruction speeds. So I've gone through the processor data path here and I put the speeds on how long each part of these processor takes. And now let's calculate the maximum time to execute the following instructions, and from that, figure out how fast the processor can run. 
So let's take a look at add i. So add i is 45 nanoseconds. How did I come up with that? Well, there are two paths here. So there's a path through the register file, and here's the register file path. We go through the instruction memory, we read from the register file, we do the ALU, we don't need to do the memory. Then we come back and write back into the register file. So 10 plus 5 plus 20 plus 5, or 40 nanoseconds. But there's another path, because this is what the part of the register file read does. We also have the immediate part. So the immediate path's a little bit different. So for the immediate, we still go through the instruction, but then we do the sign extend, and we send the sign extend into the ALU before we go back around and write it back. So in this example, that's 10 plus 10 plus 20, and then going back to write in 5. So this is actually longer. You can see that the immediate path takes 45 nanoseconds, whereas the register file path only takes 40 nanoseconds. So that's because the sign extend in this example takes 10 nanoseconds, whereas the register file only takes 5. So how long does this instruction take? Well, it has to take the maximum amount of time. So the maximum amount of time is for the immediate instruction, so it'll take 45 nanoseconds. Now let's take a look at add. So add's going to take 40 nanoseconds. In fact, add's going to be exactly the same as the register path in add i. So here it is. We do the same thing because we don't have to go through the sign extent. Now let's take a look at branch equal. So what do we have to do for branch equal? Well, we have to subtract and get to the PC. So what does that path look like? When we start out here, we go through the instruction memory, we read our register file values, we do our subtraction to see if they're equal. When we see if they're equal, then when we go to the, the uh, MUX over here to select the right next value, and then we go back around. So that's 10 plus 5 plus 20 plus 5 in this example. Okay, that's one path, but there's another path here. How long does it take us if we go through this other part of the path here? So to get to here, it takes us 5 nanoseconds. So we need to go through this adder. Now that 5 nanoseconds is shorter than the amount of time it takes us to get through this path. So that means that this is not going to affect the length of the path, and the length of the path is going to be the longest one, which is the blue path here, or 40 nanoseconds. Now let's take a look at load word. So load word's the really long one here, and that's because we're going to go through the memory, and the memory is really slow compared to the rest of the processor. So here's the load word path. We go through the instruction memory, we do a sign extend, because remember we're going to add the constant offset to calculate the address, go through the adder, then we're going to have to access the memory. The memory takes a long time here before we get back. So this is 10 plus 10 plus 20 plus 100 plus 5, or 145 nanoseconds. Now, how fast can the whole processor go? Well, it's limited by the slowest instruction. So this is the slowest instruction, which means we need to run the program slow enough that this slowest instruction has time to finish. So in that case, it's 1 over 145 nanoseconds, or 7 megahertz in this example. 